Okay, so today's webinar is entitled The Piggy Bank for the Youth of Today. Being um, uh, Youth Month, we just had uh, obviously June the 16th last week or Sunday and we celebrated on, on Monday. Um, so I thought I'll, I'll talk along the lines of, of investing for the youth. But um, just to kick off, uh, a five-year research project on youth savings way back in 2015 showed that young people could and will save if given the opportunity to do so. So um, that's one of my um, ideas that I want to share with you guys today. That's number one. And number two, um, gone are the, I said to a large extent, the, 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 the tradition of a piggy bank. I remember when I was a kid, uh, my father had, gave me a piggy bank. But a piggy bank it can be fun and effective way to teach your children about saving money. And I think that, as I said, the tradition has gone uh, to a large extent. And I think... Um, and that's one of my objectives through this webinar is to bring that kind of idea back. But um, the idea is that buy your, buy your kids a piggy bank. There are a lot of them on, available in the market. When the, when the piggy bank fills up, uh, you encourage your kids to, to obviously take the money to the bank and to deposit the money in the bank. And um, when that's finished, you buy them another piggy bank. Okay. But uh, those, those piggy banks can only go so far. They eventually run out of space. And they're very easy to, to obviously to access uh, for impulse buying. Um, and that's where you also have to teach your children about discipline. Um, so the idea today is um, a more promising strategy is to teach your children how to save money uh, by opening up obviously a savings account. Go one step further is to open up an investment account in their name and obviously teach them about investments. So um, those of you that don't know me, my name is Sean van den Berg. I'm an investment specialist here at PSG Wealth. Um, this is where we're going to discuss. Oops, sorry. Let me just get out of the way here. This is our agenda for topics for discussion today quickly. Some economic reasons why we need, to, why the youth needs to uh, start saving. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot on starting them young. And then um, just some of the ideas along the magic of compounding and some of the vehicles we can use for retirement, dream home and education and things like that. Okay. So, um, Let's get, 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 get started. Um, economic reasons why the youth needs to start saving. So we all know that South Africa's current economic condition is obviously not so healthy, but it also means that it, it will only get harder to save for the future. But at the same time, South Africans need to save more than ever before. The stagnant economy with rising dependency ratios, and I'll explain that now in more detail, means saving for the long term is becoming ever more challenging. And I see it all the time. We're talking, we're talking in the next few slides about the sandwich generation. I'm part of the sandwich generation. I've got young children and I've got older parents to look after, so I'm squashed in, in the middle. But uh, coming back to the dependency, the, the dependency ratio, the dependency ratio is a measure of the total number or the number of dependents aged 0 to 14, so the children, and then over the age of 65, compared to the total population aged between 15 and 64. So the point is that the dependency ratio is the number of dependents in the population divided by the number of working age people. Okay. So we always say uh, we're working for people that are grabbing a... Uh, uh, um, the, the pensions, and that's basically what it is. The higher the ratio, the greater the burden carried by the working age people. In other words, more financial stress on, on stress on the working class people. That's number one. On the other side of the coin, a low dependency ratio means that there are sufficient people working who can support a dependent population. And obviously, we know with the unemployment, high unemployment in South Africa that the onus is on the working people. So the lower the ratio would also allow for better pensions and a better health care for our clients. Or, or, sorry, for, for the citizens. So as I mentioned just now, I talk, I talk about the sandwich generation, and I sincerely believe we're sitting on a ticking time bomb. Uh, we're going to be squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and uh, uh, something, something has to give. So if we look at the economic reasons why we need savings, first of all, there's six reasons. Um, Current, current, save, current saving rates are less than previous generations. Now, young people, as I say, are saving far too little. And this is a challenge I have with even my children, trying to get them to save in, in the piggy banks and things like that. They can either save or spend, but they cannot do both with the same rand. And I'm, trying, I'm always trying to get that through to my children. 
spending is spending more is fine for business growth number one and number two obviously government which collects more taxes when consumption is high but not for retirement and I know that this is also where the young children are you think about retirement right now they're living for short-term gains the coming back don't worry about your children now let's go for a bit more with the younger the younger adults young people must start saving more or otherwise face retirement in poverty and financial stress and we're seeing this happening at the moment so as I say there's a ticking time bomb if tax rates go down saving more is easier but uh, what are the chances of tax rates coming down that means saving will only become harder okay so I was, uh, it was interesting to find this slide um, Personal savings in South Africa averaged 4.74% from 1962 to, until uh, 2018. Now, the old maximum is to save 10% of your income. The average is 4.74. That was until last year. And uh, in between, obviously, way back in 1972, the high was 23.8% they were saving. This is household savings. It reached a record low. Of, of minus 2.7 in the fourth quarter of 2013. The household savings rate for South Africa did decrease to negative 0 0.5 in the fourth quarter of 2018, and that dropped from, uh, from 0 0.2 in the third quarter of 2018. So you can see that downward, I put that little red arrow in to show you the downward trend regarding the savings ratio, and hence what I say, the, the, the ticking time bomb. We're not saving. It's going to have a, a, a problems down the road. That's number one. And number two, you know, we're talking about savings plans are replacing pension funds. You know, pensions have all but disappeared out of the commercial workspace. You know, except for the government jobs, uh, pensions have been replaced with what I call tax-free savings plans. And we all know that the maximum you can save in the tax-free is 33000 a year. That is definitely not enough. Okay. Um, so I say there's a tongue-in-cheek. Uh, the youth are not thinking about retirement, they're not thinking long term, they're thinking short term. So this is one of the challenges I also find in the marketplace right now. Young people will face massive debts. And obviously we, we know really, and I spoke about this in the last two webinars, university fees have grown exponentially, leaving graduates with huge burdens before they even think about buying a house. Okay. Um, even the elderly are going into retirement with large home loans and often unpaid credit obligations. Okay, people are living way above their means. One in five households are struggling to pay medical debt. That's scary. 42% of homeowners aged between 65 and 75 still have a home loan in retirement. Okay, worse than that, worse than that and I spoke again also in, in previous webinars, we, spoke, we talked about an emergency fund. Emergency reserves are so low that over 60% of households will have to borrow money to pay a, a thousand rand car repair bill. <laughs> That's scary. Okay. Number four, the adult children and, and, and elderly parents will need help. This comes back to what I was saying just now, the sandwich generation. Baby boomers and, and millennials will need additional support either from their children or in the form of more welfare, I'll stroke, uh, call it charity, because they have saved too far too little and are prematurely premature withdrawing on the retirement savings. We're seeing this all the time. People are... are, are you know, something's happened, they're living above their means, the credit, the debt is way, way too high, and they're getting, they're selling off the, the, uh, the investments to, um, obviously pay off that. That's not good. Most have hardly ever, to, they can't even cover emergencies, as I mentioned just now. So, more elderly moms and dads, and this is the trend I see also quite often, are having to sell their homes and moving back with their children. This is the opposite of what the young people are supposed to be doing today. Okay. They will live longer. Young people will live longer with, obviously, uh, improved medical care and improved scientific discoveries. We all know that uh, they're starting to push life expectancies higher. They say that a 65-year-old man, um, the life expectancy for a 65-year-old man is over 84 and almost 87 for a, for a woman. Further, 25% of these people will live past 90, and 10% will live past 95. So, obviously, young people have to save more money to support a longer retirement life and ever-increasing medical aid costs. Okay, and I can tell you now, the young people are not even thinking about this.
And number six, and this is also what scares me, they have not den done any retirement analysis. In many cases, their savings habits are so bad that they simply do not want to face their own problem. Okay, so that's a bit of an ostrich approach. There are people earning income of over one million rand a, a, a year who have never saved. This is what I find scary. There are people of savings in the millions, on the other hand, okay, who are at risk of exhausting their savings because their lifestyle they want to maintain. They're living way above their means, okay, living for today. Many people with very modest incomes, on the other hand, have done some financial planning, okay, have, some, have saved some money and will be free of a home loan uh, when they retire. So bottom line, what can we get out of this? You know, and this is what I want to stress you know, with, with this whole presentation. Start planning for retirement early, okay? If you're a worker, you're earning a salary, you need to know how much you can save every month. And retirement, uh, retirees also need to know um, how much they can spend. So how much you withdraw? I had people this week withdrawing too, too, too much money. They run out of money before they even get to the age of 70. So plans need to be, you know, you know, will never be perfect. A financial plan will never be perfect, but they need to be redone periodically. And this is where, where the financial advisor comes in. You might come visit you once a month, or sorry, once a year. Jeez, I suggest that you get more involved with your finances. Don't just wake up once a year. So periodic updates provides feedback that, that corrects our past as, uh, assumptions with regards to our, our financial returns, as well as inflation, as well as life expectations. We're going to more about these things in the next few slides. So this is what I want to spend a lot of time on. Start them young. Most people never study the subject of money. And I try and get, uh, try and encourage my children to learn about money by reading through books and things like that. And the last few webinars, I've been talking about a book called Rich Dad Poor Dad. I know some of you don't uh, like uh, some of these things he talks about there. But I really believe... I like it because it makes it simpler for a young person to understand. There's a, a book called Rich Kid, Rich Kid, Poor Kid. So it, it talks their language. So when your children start, when they start working and they get a salary and they balance their, their budgets, that's all most people do right now. Okay, there's more to that. They wonder why they have money problems. So a few people realize that it's a lack of financial education that is the problem. And that's why I, why I like Robert Kiyosaki's books. He's very much hobbing, uh, uh, hopping on financial education. So when I talk about uh, starting them young, um, the six or seven uh, uh, core principles that I like uh, from, from, the, from that book, number one is the rich do not trade time for money. And this is what I'm trying to teach my daughter now. She's still at school. And she wants to be a surgeon one day. I said, at the end of the day, yes, you could be a surgeon. You t you're earning lots of money, but you're still changing your time for money. So I need her to start changing ideas there too. So rich people do not work for their money. Uh, middle, low class people work for their money. Rich people have money work for them. So that's why I'm teaching my children at a young age the importance of investing. Challenge your thinking about work, about work and money. That's the, the point number one. Point number two. Rich people buy buy assets. They buy uh, poor people buy liabilities that they think are assets. And this is where I'm going to put my neck out there, and I always say, you know, uh, you're buying your house is not an asset because there's still levies to be paid, there's water and lights. So before you guys get upset with me, just understand my definition of an asset, and I agree with Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, the asset puts money in your pocket; it, it generates more money, whereas a liability takes away money from your pocket. If you buy a rental property, it's a different story, okay? So we need to understand very clearly what's the difference. Number three, the, the rich focus on assets while everyone else focus on the income statement. So the rich people focus on acquiring more and more assets over time. The more they acquire, the larger their income producing streams, okay? And we'll talk about it in the next few slides. And the more freedom they'll gain over time because they become less dependent on the traditional job for, for, for income. And that's what I'm trying to uh, reinstate, uh, re, um, how can I say, uh, enforce my, reinforce my daughter. Conversely, most people focus purely on increasing their income while never actually using their income to buy income producing assets. Okay. So point number four, um, the rich always focus on increasing their financial IQ. I think that's a, that's a given. So, 
they focus on things like psych human psychology and things like money management and compound interest. And I'll talk about it in the next few slides, the magic of compounding. But the idea is that we learn more by, by reading more. So, and I'll explain it into more detail, but that's where we could talk about financial education. Um, I want to speed it up a bit here. The rich sees opportunities to invest money. Yeah, I mean by, they don't just acquire assets, they build on their assets. So they have side hustles, they create businesses and websites and things like that. The rich uh, work to learn and not for job security. So yeah, learn to grow learn skills like sales and leadership and other marketable skills that obviously helps them to demand a high income for their work. Okay, point number seven, uh, the rich avoid the most common obstacles. This is what they always say, uh, the people you spend time with and the books you read. So obstacles include obviously laziness and cynicism and, uh, and um, fear and bad habits and hanging out with complainers. That's what I mean by that last little point. Okay. But the bottom line is just having these principles at heart. It's our way. I look at it as thinking differently. Okay. So let's move on. And I've, I've mentioned this on the previous, the previous webinars and I really believe in this. The six uh, money jars, um, the most important, and we could be hopping on this one here, is uh, the, the 10%. Remember, the, I said earlier on, the average is less than, than 0 0.5 at the moment. Start your children young to save at least 10% into what we call a financial freedom account. This is your golden goose. You never kill the golden goose. The golden goose lays the golden eggs. Okay, so this is where the principle comes in where we say never or sorry, um, pay yourself first, okay, and then you divide up your income, your salary, your first, your first, first salary check. Yes, you can spend most of it, fifty percent of it on, on necessities. This is what you need to obviously uh, live, okay. And then we're going to have other little baskets or uh, other jars. You might say, okay, ten percent for, for for giving. I call it giving. And that's where you allocate some money to tithing, either to your church, or you can also add, uh, give to your to a charity. Uh, I believe firmly in a 10% uh, for education. This is for personal development. This is where you're reading those books coming into ha handy. Um, I subscribe to a thing called mental, uh, mentalbox.com. It's an online facility uh, where you subscribe and you can access to a lot of books. Um, and they do a summary and things like that for you. Um, Audible. I, I like to listen to books in my car. But that's where the 10% comes through. And then we have this thing called 10% long-term savings. This is a nice day of purchases. You, you save up towards that TV. You save up towards the holidays. Okay, we don't buy things on credit. If you can talk to, talk, talk to your children or teach your children at a young age about credit and the, and the dangers of credit and, and the importance of saving towards that, you'll, I think we'll have a much better society going forward. And then lastly, obviously, you worked hard for your money. You want to allocate some money to fun. This is where you save towards something special, be it a massage, a weekend away, nice bottle of wine, etc. Okay, but taking this concept, and we're going to the next one, where we talk about uh, the cash flow. And, and um, so start of number one, your income resources, your sources will be obviously right in the beginning if you're working for a salary, and your children, your very first week, first month when they start working, um, the idea here is that it's a pool of money that you get to start with every month, um, basically from your job, and um, the idea is to build up passive income. You want to get to the situation where you're not relying on your job. Okay, so when your passive income equals your salary income, then we are financially independent. Okay, so that's the idea. Step number one. Step number two, going back to my six jars, is how you spend that money. So pay yourself first, and that's where that 10% uh, comes in. Pay yourself first, and then between 50 and 70 percent, most of the people are, are what we call um, expenses. So you can break it down into fixed expenses or variable expenses. As that variable expenses, the luxuries and the travel plans, and there's little gadgets that we can play around with. Okay. But step number three, and this is what's important, is taking that 10 percent and putting it into, us, into what I call the financial freedom account. You set it aside, and then you invest it. So in our talk today. You want to be investing, and the younger your children are, the more risk they can take on. So you have exposure to equity funds, have exposure to uh, property funds, because obviously the income in that from that. But that's a process, and we start generating income from this, and we ultimately bring it back here, and it gets recycled and recycled. And that's the idea. Okay, so 
Let's talk about the magic of compounding. And this is the concept that I, if we can teach our children about this at a young age, it would be very, very important. So Albert Einstein once said, and we all know Albert Einstein is a renowned scientist, he says, compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. He who understands it, earns it. Who does it he who doesn't, pays it. Okay, so you should grab some water quickly. So some of you might have heard of the story of the chessboard. There was once a high-ranking political minister who won a contest held by a king. The king, who was very wealthy, told the minister he can ask for anything that he wanted. The high-ranking political minister made a simple uh, question or a simple ask. He wanted a chessboard and one grain of wheat. But he then asked the king to promise him that on every subsequent day, the king would double the number of grains he would give him until every piece of the chessboard was, was, was full. Those of you who know what a chessboard looks like, there's, there's eight, eight by eight, so there's 64 blocks on a chessboard. So the king thought, gee, well, this minister was smart, but geez, he could have asked for something more. But we all know what happens with this whole story. And uh, obviously he grants the, the king grants this minister's wish. But you notice on the first day, okay, the, the grain of wheat was there. Next day there was two. Next day there was four. Next day there was eight, 16, and so on. On the 20th day, the king gave the minister over a million grains of wheat. And he soon realized that he couldn't be able to fulfill the minister's promise because by the 30th day, okay, we're not even halfway yet, he would have given him over a billion grains of wheat. On the 64th day, over 18 billion grains of, uh, 18 billion billion grains of wheat. That's over a thousand times the number of grains of wheat in existence in the world. So, the fable illustrates the power of compounding, number one, and number two, also our inability to grasp it. So, all of us know this little joke, or it was more of a trick question when we were kids. When you were a kid, perhaps one of your friends asked you the following trick question. Would you rather have 10,000 Rand per day for 30 days, or one Rand that would double in value every day for 30 days? I suggest ask your children that. And... Um, Today, we, know, we choose, obviously, the doubling rand, going back to my chessboard story, because at the end of 30 days, we'd have over 5 million rand versus uh, 300,000 with 10,000 rand a day. Okay, so let's look at the components of compound interest. One rand invested at a 10% return will be worth one rand 10 at the end of the year. So invest that one rand ten for next year, and you'll get ten percent again on that money. And you'll end up with one rand twenty-one in two years from now on your original investment. So the first year you earned ten cents. On your second year you generated eleven cents. So this is a very simplistic way of how compounding works. Okay, gains begets gains, and I'm keeping it simple so you can explain to your children. However, if you increase the amounts and increase the time involved. And the benefits of compounding becomes more pronounced. And this is where we start bringing in the big amounts in. So compounding interest is often called the 8th one of the world, we mentioned just now, because it seems to possess magical powers, like turning one rand into five million rand. The great part about compound interest is that it applies to money and helps us to achieve our financial goals, such as becoming a millionaire or retiring uh, comfortably or becoming financially independent. So... The main thing about compounding interest is to understand it's a long-term investment strategy, number one. And number two, if you own a unit trust, and this is a great for children, compounding allows you to earn interest on your principal. Okay? Compounding also allows you, uh, also occurs when you reinvest your earnings. So take your profits or take your dividends and reinvest it, and that also helps to compound it further. Okay? So the other example and I just took 500 Rand because that's our minimum contribution for a unit trust account. Uh, you invested for 40 years. So we start someone at the age of 25. Someone just started working at his very first job, puts it into 500 Rand, invested, uh, and he has equity exposure. And I'm being very conservative here. I'm working on 10% growth over the long term. And I'm presuming we're choosing a, a PSG fund. If you choose a PSG fund, the, the, the ongoing platform fee is only 0.3%. Okay. So over 40 years, that 500 rand per month will equate to nearly 5 million in, four, in 40 years' time. And I've also taken consideration inflation. Okay. So the annual contribution will increase by at least the inflation rate. And I'm, as I say, I'm working on 6% here. Okay. 
So after 40 years, 500 rand a month would equate to five, over 5 million rand. Okay, so that just shows you the the magic of compounding. So that's just one example, and I, I'm being so conservative just to 500 rand a month. And obviously, do more than that, it would be obviously big amounts. Okay. So that brings into what we call the rule of 72. It's a simple way to know the time it takes for the money to double is to use the rule of 72. If you wanted to know how many years it would take for the investment earning 12% to double, okay, simply divide 72 by 8, okay, and the answer would be 9 years. So guys, here's my log, my, um, uh, sorry, that was wrong there. That should have been 8% there. Earning 8% to double, simply divide 72 by 8, and the answer will be 9 years. I like this little uh, cartoon here. It says, I know the answer. I'm just letting the suspense build. <laughs> okay. The reverse is true also. If you wanted to know what interest rate you would have to earn to double your money in 5 years, divide 72 by 5, and the answer will be 15%. So if you want to double your money in, in 5 years' time, you need to be earning 15% per, per, per annum. If you wanted to know the effects of inflation, on your investment. Just put your money under the mattress. If inflation is 6%, it would take roughly about 11.2% to halve the purchasing power of that money. Put a million rand under your, under your mattress, 11 years time, as I say, be worth 500,000. Okay, so that's a rule of 72. Teach your children that also. Okay, very simple little rule. So the effects of inflation, and the <coughs> excuse me, It takes, the inflation is a measure of the buying power of one rand. It tells me how much uh, item will cost down the road due to cost producing and things like that. Now, interesting to see, I used to be, a, when I was in school, I used to be a, a spur waiter. We used to call them casuals. Way back in the, in the 80s, um, we used to have spur menus made out of wooden boards, and some of you might remember that. But if you look at that wooden board, look what a spur burger cost way back in 1980. It was 4 95 Look at the picture on the right-hand side. That's the current spur menu. It's 69 rand 90 for the same burger. So that's equals to 1,312% increase over 40%, over 40 years, or equivalent of 32.8% increase per year. That's scary. So if it carries on going like this, you can imagine in a few years' time, you're paying nearly 230 rand for a burger, a spur burger. <laughs> okay. So it's very important, that, and this is what I want to say, is compare your investments that you, uh, to, to inflation. If you're not beating inflation, you're going backwards. Yeah. So here's an example of investing 5,000 rand a year, 60,000 a year, uh, over 35, uh, over 35, excuse me, years, but obviously taking inflation in, into consideration. So this is investing just at inflation, so at 6%. So that's 5,000 a year. So uh, 60,000 a year uh, compounded over 35,000 year, uh, over 35 years, eventually get to 15 million. Okay. Uh, if you adjust it now for another plus, plus two, so there you get to 21 and so it goes on. See the big differences here. So we're talking about 37 compared to 15 if you're up in forward inflation by just 5%. So if inflation is, is, uh, at, at, at six and you're only earning 10, you obviously only making 4%, and that's what we're talking about over here. Okay, so that's why another reason for you need to be hands-on with your investments. You can't just leave it. Forget about it and read it and leave it. Okay, so let's move on. So, yes, you're trying to not think about retirement, but going, going back to this year, if they have this kind of money, they can do whatever they want to. Okay, so, yes, we can have a happy retirement. We can look at buying a nice little dream home, and, and obviously education for their children. But, you know, money is power. And uh, the better they have is money than not to have the money. Okay. So there's various ways we're looking at it. And this is what I'm talking to the parents now for your children. As a starting point, I suggest that as, as young as they, uh, this, as soon as they're born, open a thing like a voluntary investment plan in their name. Put 500 rand a month away. By the time of the 18, you've acquired a, quite a nice little lump sum for them. So there's a whole range of, of unit trust you can choose from. Obviously, you can go for heavy equity exposure. Long term gives you your chance for the money to the funds to, rec to recover. Um, anything here, obviously, with um, voluntary investment plan, obviously, there's tax involved. So tax is payable on income and dividends, but that's down the line for your children. Yeah. Uh, you might also consider opening up a tax free investment plan for your children. And the nice thing about you, as I said just now, you can put into 33000 a year. 
maximum 500,000, but the younger they start, the easier for them. Remember, you're getting a, a the the benefits of tax-free growth. There's no capital gains, no interest uh, uh, paid, or uh, sorry, tax on interest and or on dividends. So that can compound further long term. The, the earlier you start for your children, the better. And then once your children start working, then I suggest they look at things like a retirement annuity. This is the over and above. If they've got a pension fund, remember you can put up to 27.5 percent of the income away. Okay. We're limited to 350000 a year. Uh, you might look at it as a disadvantage. You can only have access to your money at the age of 55. I look at it as, a, as an advantage because it's disciplined savings. I can't get my money, to, my hands on my money. Remember the previous two funds? Yes, the, the advantage is I have flexibility. I have access to that money. But remember, you're investing for your children. Um, so um, <laughs> it's your discipline. So people, I'm running out of time here quickly. So in conclusion, here's a quick quote from uh, Joe Moore. A simple fact that it is hard to learn is that it's time to save money is when you have some. So if you start earning money, uh, put some aside for your children one day. Okay, that's where the advantage comes in. So the main thing I want to highlight for you today about personal finance, it's not a required school, uh, uh, it's not a required subject at school, which I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. If you're lucky, you have parents that have taught you the skill when you were a kid. And that's what I want to highlight for you guys today. Best thing for you as a young person is to do their own finances is to start investing from a young age. When you start working, trying to prioritize as I say, maximizing or maxing out your RA contributions at 27.5%. If you don't learn how to manage your money, other people will find ways to mismanage it for you. Okay. So in conclusion, people on call to action, if you haven't got um, any of these funds in place yet, uh, please go ahead and go register for these funds. Okay, they are tools to help you in your financial planning. This presentation, as well as the uh, recording, will be sent to you guys tomorrow. Let's see what kind of questions you guys have. Okay, Mr. Haystack, um, retirement savings. This is remember, yes, I would say yes because remember, it's money you'll never touch. You want to live off the income from your investments. So yes, to answer your question, yes. Yeah, what other questions are there? So from my side, thank you very much for being on this webinar. Any questions you have, there's my there's our, my team's uh, email address as well as our contact number. Please email us any questions you have. I'm there to help you. Okay, but from my side, thank you very much for being on this webinar. Until next month, all the best. Bye for now.